Hi, everyone. It's 11 o'clock in the morning here in sunny but cold Bloomington, Minnesota, so we're going to get started. Thanks, thanks everyone, for joining us today. I'm Sally Head Dahlquist, president here at Immunochemistry Technologies, and I will be moderating this webinar today. You may have noticed that your phone has been muted. However, we encourage you to ask questions along the way. Simply type your questions into the chat dialog box at the right and select Send to Host. If you have any technical difficulties during the webinar, please send your chat to me, and I will do my best to get you up and running. We'll be posting the video recording of the webinar later this afternoon or tomorrow, so look out in your email box for an email from us after the webinar with a link to the recording, as well as a discount code for ICT's detection products. We're offering 25% off the kits as a thank you for listening today. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker, Mrs. Tracy Murphy, who is the Director of R&D and Quality Control here at ICT. Her primary role is to direct ICT scientific staff working to develop novel reagents to monitor intracellular parameters, including apoptosis, autogyphy, mitochondrial membrane potential, and oxidative, and oxidative stress, focusing on intracellular fluorescent reagents. She oversees quality control testing to assure all products are manufactured following our quality system. She also provides technical support, so if you call in for help with an assay, she may be the one answering your questions. Tracy has a Bachelor of Science degree in Cell Biology from the University of Minnesota in Duluth, and after graduating, started her career at ICT in 2003 as a production and research associate. Before long, she was doing enzyme antibody conjugations, making ELISA assays, developing new fluorescent reagents for use in vitro and in vivo, collaborating on NIH grants, and doing R&D projects in apoptosis, eventually taking on a leadership role and helping to grow to grow the company into what it is today. We are honored to have her here with us today as our presenter. Today, Tracy will be discussing Alzheimer's and cell death, including apoptosis. Um, caspase activity, cathepsin activity, and oxidative stress all contribute to cell death in the forms of apoptosis, pyroptosis, and necrosis. And these mechanisms of cell death play a fundamental role in neurodegenerative disorders such as Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's, and Huntington's. In this webinar, Tracy will discuss the different types of cell death, the role of cell death in neurodegenerative diseases, and the methods to assess cell death in cell cultures. ICT offers a reliable and accurate line of fluorescent reagents to help researchers detect cell death using flow cytometry, fluorescence microscopy, or a fluorescence plate reader. Ultimately, these assays enable researchers to obtain a better understanding of the cell death associated events that occur as a result of drug treatments, various disease states, and other experimental conditions. And with that, I'll turn it over to Tracy. Well, thanks. Well, thank you, Sally. That was a lovely introduction. Thank you for that. And thank you, of course, to all the listeners taking the time out of their days today to join us. Um, I also wanted to extend a big thanks to those of you that visited us at the Society for Neuroscience Conference last month in Washington, D.C. Um, it was a very productive and well-attended show, and we, we certainly enjoyed the opportunity we had to connect with you guys, those of you that visited us, um, in person. So to introduce myself, I'm the Director of R&D and Quality Control here at ICT. So I work very closely with our R&D team to develop new products and applications and to keep keep products launching on our website. So as we move forward, um, in addition to your questions on today's presentation, if you happen to have any ideas or suggestions for future products, feel free to chat those in as well um, during the presentation today. So as Sally mentioned, today's talk is going to be focused on Alzheimer's disease, um, how it relates to apoptosis, necrosis, pyroptosis, and oxidative stress. And then we'll also discuss how some of the associated ICT fluorescent um, detection products can help you study Alzheimer's or other neurodegenerative diseases. Um, also, uh, please do stay tuned, as Sally mentioned this as well, but at the end of the webinar, I'm going to be giving you a special offer code for a product discount. So to give a little bit of background on ICT, uh, we're located in Bloomington, Minnesota. Um, Bloomington is a suburb just south of Minneapolis. Uh, ICT celebrated its 23rd anniversary this past September, so we've been in business for a long time. So here at ICT, we offer both products and custom services. Um, I'm going to be providing some more information on these offerings shortly, 
Um, but I did want to note that all of our products are for research use only and not for use in diagnostic procedures. When ICT was originally founded, um, we started out as a services company. So we have years of experience with protein chemistry and ELISA optimization, so we can help you develop reliable, sensitive, and specific immunoassays. We can also scale up and manufacture an assay, so all of the components are provided in a ready-to-use format. Um, if you're in need of a service project, feel free to reach out and get in touch. Our highly skilled team is happy to discuss your needs, and we do offer everything from initial consultation support to start to finish management of your project. So one product line that I wanted to briefly, just briefly touch on today is our ELISA solutions. Um, these include all of the components you need to build a better ELISA. Um, our line of coding buffers, blockers, sample and assay diluents, conjugate stabilizers, substrates, stop solutions, and wash buffer all work together to improve assay performance at every step. Uh, these products have been specifically designed to address common issues you might encounter during ELISA development. And our, our ultimate goal is to help you develop optimized ELISAs that have a high specific signal and low background noise. Um, that's all I'll mention about our ELISA products today, but if you do happen to have questions about this product line, feel free to chat them in and I can get you a response after today's webinar. Uh, the product line that we'll focus on for today's presentation is our fluorescence detection assays, or cell viability assays. These assays include a broad range of fluorescence-based whole cell assays for intracellular apoptosis detection and cellular analysis. ICT's line of assay kits can detect apoptosis, necrosis, autophagy, pyroptosis, cell-mediated cytotoxicity, activated serine proteases, oxidative stress, mitochondrial membrane potential, and much more. Our kits are designed for use in whole living cells, so there's no lysine of the cells required. Um, some of you might be longtime users of our popular Flicka product line for caspase detection, but we do offer so much more in a wide range of fluorescent applications. So here's an outline for today's agenda. Um, we'll first begin with a little bit of background on Alzheimer's disease. Then we'll move on to a discussion of the apoptotic and necrotic pathways and how they play a role in Alzheimer's. Uh, we'll explore the role of oxidative stress. And then finally, we'll wrap up with a discussion of pyroptosis and how it impacts neuronal diseases. Now, as we move through these key topics, we'll also tie in and discuss how some of the related detection products offered by ICT work, and we'll review some sample data along the way as well. In this talk today, I wanted to briefly touch on the reach of Alzheimer's. Um, Alzheimer's is the most common form of dementia, and this is a progressive disease. Um, it typically presents with memory loss symptoms, um, most commonly after 60 years of age, and the symptoms gradually worsen over a number of years. The disease affects the regions of the brain involved with thought, memory, and language. There are currently more than 5 million people in the U.S. living with Alzheimer's disease, and it's the sixth leading cause of death among U.S. adults. It's estimated that by the year 2050, the number could more than triple to 16 million people. There is currently no cure for the disease, and the cause and the mechanisms of Alzheimer's is still largely unknown. However, research continues, looking for treatment options to help Alzheimer's patients and their loved ones. So there are several hallmark neuropathological characteristics of Alzheimer's disease. Um, these include synaptic loss, nerve cell loss in the cerebral cortex, the hippocampus and amygdala, and plaques consisting of extracellular deposits of amyloid beta, and tangles made up of hyperphosphorylated tau proteins inside the nerve cells. So now that we've covered some of the background and the pathology of Alzheimer's, uh, let's shift gears a bit to discuss cell death, which is a major event present in many neurodegenerative diseases. Now, when we're talking about cell death, apoptosis and necrosis are two different mechanisms of cell death, although these mechanisms can sometimes overlap. Apoptosis, or programmed cell death, is a process controlled by genes. These genes can be activated from a variety of environmental stimuli, including DNA damage, oxidative stress, or exposure to things such as hormones, viruses, drugs, or toxins. Now, in looking at necrosis, this process is not programmed, and it does not rely on gene transcription. Um, rather, necrosis is actually a pathological event, and it happens when there's trauma to the cells. 
Now, as we can see in this table, there are some key differences in the features of apoptosis and necrosis. Apoptosis is generally characterized by the shrinking of the cells, the membrane blebbing, and the condensation of the chromatin. These cells then fragment into small apoptotic bodies that are phagocytosed by macrophages, meaning there's not a lot of associated inflammation with apoptosis. Now, in contrast, in, in necrotic cells, the cells swell up, the DNA de degenerates, the membrane disintegrates, and this, this induces a huge inflammatory response. So here we have a visual representation of the two processes side by side. So on the right, you can see the shrinking of the apoptotic cell, the blebbing and the fragmentation, and then the phagocytosis. While on the left, you see the swelling and the lysing of the necrotic cell. Now, with respect to apoptosis, caspases are the enzymes underlying this whole process. So caspases, or cysteine-dependent aspartate-directed proteases, are activated, and then they go on to cleave substrates, and this leads to the eventual disassembly of the cell. Uh, there are two different groups of caspases, those involved with apoptosis and those involved in inflammation. Now, in terms of apoptosis, Initiator caspases regulate apoptosis upstream by initiating caspase cascades, while effector caspases are responsible for proteolytic cleavages that lead to cell disassembly. Now, with regards to inflammation, this process is heavily dependent on the activity of caspase 1, which is associated with inflammasome activity. Caspase 1 is a key housekeeping enzyme in its conversion of pro-IL-1 beta into the active IL-1 beta cytokine. Um, we'll go, we're going to be talking more about inflammation in our discussion of pyroptosis later on in the webinar. Um, this slide shows an overview of the extrinsic and intrinsic apoptotic pathways. The extrinsic pathway, I'll just go ahead and circle that, um, is, is depicted on the right here. It's typically activated by death receptor ligands, like FAST ligand, and these bind to receptors at the surface of the cell which would turn cluster and activate caspase 8, which is the orange caspase shown here. And active caspase 8 then goes on and cleaves caspases 3 and 7, shown in green, and this brings about rapid cell death. Now, the intrinsic pathway depicted on the left, I'll just go ahead and circle this for you guys as well. Um, this is typically activated by one of numerous cell stresses, um, things like DNA damage, and then this would lead to mitochondrial outer membrane permeabilization and then the release of proteins such as cytochrome C. So cytochrome C is shown as these black circles here. I'll circle that. And then cytochrome C goes on and binds the cytosolic adapter molecule APAF1 or apoptosis activating factor 1 shown here. And these two get together and form the apoptosome. And then once, once formed, the apoptosome can recruit and activate pro-caspase 9. So that's shown here and then it's shown in blue after it becomes activated. And then caspase 9 is considered an initiator caspase, and then that actually activates the effector caspases, caspases 3 and 7, shown in green. And then this, this eventually goes on to cleave hundreds of different proteins, and this brings about apoptotic cell death. Now, in terms of Alzheimer's, there's a proposed hypothesis in which amyloid beta triggers the activation of the caspases, leading to proteolysis of tau and neurofibrillary tangle formation. So this hypothesis links these key disease hallmarks, namely the presence of amyloid beta deposits and the neurofibrillary tangle pathologies. The proposed pathway here shows the amyloid precursor protein cleaved by beta and gamma secretases forming amyloid beta. So that's what's happening in this top part of the slide, circle that. Um, so in the one pathway, amyloid beta aggregates into oligomers, resulting in the production of reactive oxygen species, or ROS, and then these ROS go on and induce oxidative stress, resulting in cell death. Now, in the alternative pathway, or possibly this could be occurring simultaneously, amyloid beta activates caspases, and then the caspases go on to cleave critical cellular proteins. As we discussed on the last slide, some of these would include actin, fodrin, and tau, now, with tau in particular, this cleavage could result in hyperphosphorylation, 
Um, also, this would contribute to the destabilization of the cytoskeleton by impacting microtubules and axonal transport. So eventually, the cytoskeletal disruption, the destabilized microtubules, and in the, the impaired axonal transport would result in neuronal cell death. So there's also the possibility that caspases, once activated, would facilitate a positive feedback loop, as caspases are known to cleave amyloid precursor protein. So this would continue on the whole process. So if you're studying Alzheimer's uh, with relation to caspase activity, how can you detect whether caspases are active in your cell culture? ICT's flicicates, or fluorescent labeled inhibitors of caspases, offer an in vitro whole cell detection method to study caspase activity in apoptotic cells. Our FLICA assays are available for a variety of different caspases, as well as polycaspase activity, and the samples can be analyzed by a flow cytometer, fluorescence plate reader, or a fluorescence microscope. Um, we have FLICA options available in green, red, and far red as well. Uh, let's for this slide, let's take a look at how FLICA works. Um, first, all FLICA reagents consist of three key components. Number one, a fluorescent reporter tag. Two, a caspase targeting peptide sequence, um, shown as YVAD here, and an FMK reactive group is the final group. Um, the FMK reactive group actually forms a covalent bond with the catalytic sites on the active caspase enzyme. So this enables the FLICA probes to be retained within the cell despite the subsequent wash steps. Now, once the FMK reactive groups on the FLICA probes form covalent bonds with the catalytic cysteine groups within the caspase reactive site, the caspase enzyme is inhibited. It can no longer cleave any substrates. So now that we've discussed a little bit how FLICA works, let's examine some sample data of FLICA in action. Now, we're just going to be covering a couple examples today, and these examples were selected because they're neuroscience specific. Um, however, if you want to check out our website or our other webinar recordings, uh, we do have other flow data, we have other plate reader data, et cetera, um, in a variety of different contexts. So in this particular experiment, cryopreserved primary neuronal cells from the rat brain were thawed and grown in cell culture. Now, the goal here was to show the sensitivity of the cryo cryopreserved rodent brain neuronal cells for drug-induced neurotoxicity. Hydrogen peroxide was used to induce oxidative stress, and then the cells were stained with FLICA to show the apoptotic neuronal cells. We can clearly see from these images that the longer the cells were exposed to hydrogen peroxide, the more apoptosis is present. In this image, we're looking at mouse neuroblastoma cells that were treated with hydrogen peroxide and then stained with FLICA to label caspase positive cells green and hooks to label DNA blue. Now, as you can see, in both the cells, apoptosis was induced, probably more so in the cell on the left, um, and this is illustrated by the green fluorescence that we see here. One other kit that I wanted to mention in this section of the webinar is our necrosis versus apoptosis assay. As we discussed earlier, these two types of cell death are both important in Alzheimer's disease and other cell culture studies as well. Uh, this kit allows you to identify both apoptotic and necrotic cells within a single sample. Apoptotic cells are identified using ICT's FLICA reagent. Loss of integrity of the cell membrane, which is indicative of necrosis or late-stage apoptosis, is detected with the vital staining dye 7-aminoactinomycin D, or 7-AAD, which is a red fluorescing live dead stain. So 7-AAD easily penetrates uh, the cells when the cell membranes have become compromised, and it binds to GC-rich regions of the DNA. So 7-AAD alone cannot detect the cells that are in early stages of apoptosis because their cell membranes are still intact and they're capable of excluding it at that point. Um, but as the caspases are active during early apoptosis, by combining FAMFLICA with 7-AAD, this can actually provide a more detailed picture of the overall health of the cell population. So in fact, pairing these two different types of fluorescent cell status indicator reagents within a single test often reveals a significant percentage of cells that are 7-AAD negative, meaning they're membrane intact live cells, and yet they're FAMFLICA positive, meaning they're apoptotic and they're in the process of dying. Uh, this kit can be analyzed using fluorescence microscopy or flow cytometry. So here in this image, the early stage apoptotic cells are stained green, and most of them look to be in that 
stage, and then there's a few necrotic cells in the sample that only exhibit red fluorescence. And then we also do see some green and red fluorescing cells that are in late stage apoptosis. Shifting gears now, I want to talk a little bit about oxidative stress. Now, under normal physiological conditions, cells control reactive oxygen species levels by balancing the generation of ROS with their elimination of, by scavenging molecules such as antioxidants. However, under conditions of oxidative stress, excessive ROS levels build up and they can then lay damage to various cellular components. Some of the most harmful effects of reactive oxygen species exposure are the damage of DNA, the oxidation of polyunsaturated fatty acids and lipids, also this is known as lipid peroxidation, the oxidation of the amino acids found in proteins, and the oxidative deactivation of specific enzymes. In the research surrounding Alzheimer's disease, evidence of oxidative stress manifests through increased levels of highly oxidized proteins, DNA, and lipids, higher amounts of free metal ions that can generate free radicals, advanced glycation end products, formation of toxic species, including peroxides, alcohols, aldehydes, free carbonyls, ketones, and also oxidative modifications in both nuclear and mitochondrial DNA. In addition, research shows that Alzheimer's disease-associated amyloid beta induces an oxidative environment for neurons, as we discussed on a previous slide. This figure was included just to show some sources and effects of oxidative stress, both on a molecular and a cellular level. Um, it's just meant to show a high-level overview at this point. Um, however, if you'd like more information, um, check out our webinar archive on our website as we recently had a webinar on oxidative stress. The error catastrophe theory for oxidative stress in Alzheimer's postulates that positive feedback loops are created in neurodegenerative diseases that contribute to the pathology of the disease. So in Alzheimer's, it is believed that damage to cellular constituents occurs, while at the same time cellular defense mechanisms weaken. Because of this, the cell cannot repair the damage quickly and efficiently, and then the damages continue to, continue to accumulate, leading to loss of function of the neurons and ultimately to cell death. At ICT, we carry a growing list of oxidative stress assay kits. Due to limited time today, I'm only going to cover three of the kits today, the one shown in red here, um, intracellular total ROS activity assay, DNA damage ELISA, and our intracellular GSH assay. However, if you're interested in learning more about any of these other kits, um, as I already mentioned, we do have a webinar recording on oxidative stress, so go ahead and check that out for more detail. So first of all, I'd like to introduce our intracellular total ROS activity assay. Uh, this kit utilizes the proprietary oxidation-sensitive probe called Total ROS Green. Now on its own, the cell permeate dye is non-fluorescent, but when in the presence of intracellular reactive oxygen species, it becomes oxidized to its green fluorescence-capable form, making it easy to detect by flow cytometry. Now the histogram shown here depict the results from Jercat suspension cells that were preloaded with total Ross green, and then they were ex exposed to tert butyl hydroperoxide to induce the production of reactive oxygen species. The increase in Ross activity is evident in the overlay histogram, which is shown at the far right. The mock treated cells are represented by the black line, and the tert butyl hydroperoxide treated cells are represented by the red line. Now here you can see a nice shift in median fluorescence intensity between the two, di two different populations. Next up, I wanted to briefly touch on our ELISA kit for the quantification of 8-hydroxy-2-deoxyguanosine, or 8-OHDG, which is produced by the oxidative damage of DNA by reactive oxygen and nitrogen species. 8-OHDG serves as an established marker of oxidative stress. ICT's kit is compatible with a variety of sample types, including urine, cell culture medium, plasma, tissue samples, and saliva. This is a competitive ELISA, so it utilizes an 8-OH-DG coded plate, and then any 8-OH-DG present in samples competes with that coded on the plate for binding with an HRP conjugated detection antibody specific for 8-OH-DG. So therefore, in this way, the greater the amount of analyte found in the sample, the more likely the, 
that the detection antibody will bind to the free 8-OHDG found in the sample instead of binding to the material coated on the plate. So only the detection antibody that has actually bound the coated 8-OHDG will be retained and detected, and the antibody that is bound free 8-OHDG will be washed away. So this means that the greater the concentration of 8-OHDG in the sample, the lower the end signal. So in competitive ELISAs, you have an inverse relationship between the target analyte concentration in the sample and the amount of signal that you see. ICT also offers a kit for detecting intracellular levels of glutathione, or GSH. Um, GSH is used by cells as a key intracellular source of reducing power. So this helps cells deal with and prevent toxic accumulation of free radical byproducts. And GSH also plays a role as a cell signaling molecule. The key reagent in this assay is the thiobrite green dye. It's a, this cell permeate thioreactive dye quickly penetrates cell membranes and accumulates, primarily within the cytosol of live cells. In the presence of free thiol containing molecules such as GSH, the non-fluorescent thiobrite dye covalently binds to GSH, and then in the process, this converts the dye to its green fluorescence-capable form. So during periods of oxidative stress or glutathione depletion associated with cell death processes, such as apoptosis, the cytosolic concentrations of the thiobrite green become significantly diminished. So this reduction in intracellular GSH con concentration directly translates into an easily monitored reduction in green fluorescence output within the dying or oxidatively stressed cell population. Sample flow cytometry results are shown at the bottom of this slide. Here, jerkat cells were either treated with DMSO as a negative control, shown on the left, or they were exposed to one micromolar star sporin for four hours to induce apoptosis. This is shown in the middle. The effects of sarosporin on the level of intracellular glutathione can probably best be seen in the overlay histogram at the right. The green line represents the GSH levels in the mock-treated cells, and the red line represents the, the diminished GSH in the apoptotic cells. The last topic that we're, we'll cover today in today's webinar is pyroptosis. Pyroptosis is a highly inflammatory form of programmed cell death. This pathway is distinct from apoptotic cell death in that it results in cell membrane rupture and the release of pro-inflammatory cytokines. So infected cells eventually swell, burst, and die. This in turn attracts other immune cells to fight the infection, leading to inflammation of the tissue. And in a functional response, this would lead to rapid clearing of the infection. Now, in looking at this figure, we can see the pathway to the activation of the NLRP3 inflammasome. Assembly of the NLRP3 inflammasome is triggered by two signals. The first signal begins with recognition of pathogen-associated molecular patterns by toll-like receptors, such as TLR4, which, through an interaction with the adapter protein MYD88, triggers activation of the transcription factor NF-kappa-B. Once activated, NF-kappa-B is translocated to the nucleus, where it leads to the synthesis of the inactive pro-inflammatory cytokine Pro-IL-1-beta. Another potent pro-inflammatory cytokine precursor, Pro-IL-18, is constitutively expressed. However, its expression is increased after cellular activation. Uh, the second signal is triggered by an ionic perturbation of the cell, such as an efflux of potassium ions, and this is caused by the purinergic P2X receptor, which is a, a ligand-gated ion channel that opens in response to the binding of ATP. So once the second signal occurs, this results in, N in assembly of the NLRP3 inflammasome, caspase-1 activation, and the IL-1 beta and IL-18 secretion shown. So tying it all back together with Alzheimer's, pyroptosis is a factor in both acute and chronic aseptic inflammation in, in the nervous system, making it a mechanism of interest in a variety of neurodegenerative diseases. Now, in Alzheimer's, enhanced expressions of IL-1 beta and IL-18 has been observed in the nervous system. This figure illustrates one hypothetical model that links amyloid beta to the NLRP3 inflammasome to pathology of synaptic dysfunction and neuronal death. It's believed that amyloid beta could induce activation of the NLRP3 inflammasome through potassium ion fluxes and phagocytosis. 
So that's going on up at the top. And then once activated, the NLRP3 inflammasome activates caspase 1, leading to secretion of IL-1 beta. And IL-1 beta could then go on to induce amyloid plaque formation, neurofibrillary tangles, and neuronal cell death. To detect pyroptosis, ICT offers our pyroptosis caspase-1 assay kit to detect caspase-1 activation in cell cultures. Nigerisin is included in the kits as a convenient way of generating a positive control for your pyroptosis studies. And the kit is currently available in green fluorescence and can be analyzed with a fluorescence microscope, fluorescence plate reader, or flow cytometer. In this image, human colorectal adenocarcinoma cells were grown in polarized monolayers and infected with wild-type salmonella constitutively expressing M. cherry, which is shown in red. After nine hours, live cells were incubated with ICT's active caspase-1 reagent, FAMYVAD-FMK, for one hour in growth medium, washed, and then fixed. The confocal image shown reveals an extruding cell that is infected. Many red M. cherry labeled salmonella are visible. The infected cell is undergoing pyroptosis, and this is evidenced by the positive staining for active caspase 1, visible as increased green fluorescence compared to the background levels of fluorescence in the surrounding caspase 1 negative cells. In this figure, THP1 cells were treated with either a negative control, shown in the non induced bottom panel or PMA to induce differentiation into macrophages. This is shown in the induced top panel. After 48 hours, the PMA was removed from the induced population, and it was replaced with fresh medium containing LPS to induce caspase-1 activation. Cells were then stained with FAMYVAD FMK, washed, and then examined with a microscope. Now in the treated sample, we see many cells appear bright green, and this indicates an increased level of caspase-1 activity. Well, in the non-induced sample, there's few green cells visible, and this indicates a low level of caspase-1 activity. So that concludes our presentation today. Um, to begin wrapping up the presentation, I wanted um, to just mention this or show this. If you're looking for examples of our cell viability assay kits in use or any other Flicka products, um, I'd like you to know we have an extensive list of publications where our products are cited. So as you can see from this publication map, our products are being used in publications by researchers all over the world. If you're looking for specific examples of our products in use, feel free to contact us. We'd be happy to conduct a publication search for you to highlight a product of interest. As you're planning out your project or working through an experiment, uh, we do have a variety of resources available on our website to help you. You can find webinars such as this one, on a wide variety of topics. Just go to our archive on our webinars page. And we also have some short product demonstration videos if you would like to use some of our popular, if you'd like to see some of our popular kits in action. Uh, we periodically update our blog with helpful tips, new citations, and company announcements. So check there for all of your ICT news updates. And finally, we have extensive documentation in the form of product manuals, safety data sheets, and certificates of analysis. And these are all easily accessible from our product pages should you need them. To learn more about our products and services, please do visit our website. Um, or if you have specific questions, please don't hesitate. You can contact us directly. Um, you can send it, an email to help at immunochemistry.com. Um, most questions are typically answered within a day. Or for more urgent inquiries, you can pick up the phone and call us. Um, we really do love hearing how you're using our products and helping you troubleshoot your experiments. So I'd like to con conclude my presentation today, as promised, with a special offer code for our attendees. Um, thank you to everyone who attended the webinar today. You can use the, di the discount code WEBINAR20 to receive 20% off your order of any assay kit, um, and this is running now through the end of January. Uh, with that, I'd like to turn things back over to Sally, who's been fielding your questions throughout today's webinar. Hi, Tracy. Yeah, thanks for that really informative presentation on the mechanisms of Alzheimer's and explaining how the cells actually die because of the amyloid beta, well, in one theory, and the caspase activation, as well as uh, apoptosis and pyroptosis. And thanks to everyone who submitted your questions. Um, we'll go over a few of them. 
Um, one of them was, can Alzheimer's disease be diagnosed in early <coughs> phase or just late phase? Sorry. So unfortunately, no. Um, not at the present time. There's, there's no test available currently for Alzheimer's disease prediction um, while the patient is in the early phase of the disease, so prior to showing symptoms. Um, in fact, no single test exists outside a post-mortem examination of the patient's brain that would show definitively that a person indeed has Alzheimer's. So today it's still being diagnosed through a complete medical assessment. Um, this include things, includes things like mental status and mood testing, um, physical and neurological exam, other medical tests, um, usually blood and urine tests, and brain imaging as well. Um, and part of what's being done in this panel of tests is, is the doctor is trying to rule out other possible reasons for the dementia-like symptoms. So this is how it's being diagnosed. Um, however, um, we're, you know, we're a little ways off from having a quick and simple blood test. However, there are, that being said, um, the good news is there are a number of tests being developed that are still in the experimental stages that are showing promise. So stay tuned. I think a blood test is coming. It's just a matter of time. Great. Um, so another question we got, somebody asked, is, how sensitive are the FLICA kits for caspase detection? Sure. Um, well, I'm happy to answer this one. I'm actually glad this one came in because this is a question that we um, seem to get a lot. Um, the FLICA kits are actually quite sensitive. So sensitivity is rarely an issue for our customers. Um, they can actually paint a pretty clear picture of the relative level of apoptosis or caspase activity occurring within a given cell population. Um, we find the flick is actually sensitive enough to detect even the, the natural apoptosis occurring in control cells. So a normal cell turnover um, always has a background level of apoptosis in the healthy cells. Um, results from our studies show this might be anywhere from 2 to 8%, um, although this would depend on the type of cell being studied. Um, so FLICA is sensitive enough to even detect this background level of apoptosis, even at these low levels. Okay, so if I understand you, you have to be sure you have a positive and a negative control because you always see some apoptosis even in your healthy cells, right? Exactly, yeah. We always recommend a positive and a negative control along with their test samples. Okay, um, I think we have time for another question. Okay, and it is, are the mitochondrial damages in Alzheimer's similar to the mitochondrial damages in Parkinson's? Oh, okay. Well, this is actually an interesting, interesting question. Um, so before I answer this, I just wanted to add a quick comment. I think that helps frame it. Um, because of their high energy requirements, neurons are actually particularly vulnerable to injury and death from dysfunctional mitochondria. And evidence um, indeed suggests that mitochondrial dysfunction is clearly centered at the core of all the most prevalent neurodegenerative diseases. So this would include Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, Huntington's, and ALS. Um, some of the mitochondrial abnormalities that are, have been associated with neuro, neurodegenerative diseases might include things like impaired calcium flux, um, dissipation of the mitochondrial membrane potential, accumulation of mutant proteins within the mitochondria, and also defects in oxidative phosphorylation um, have been observed. And so while these defects may be common to many diseases, the particular pathway that leads to the dysfunction may differ. So for example, uh, buildup of amyloid beta within the mitochondria in Alzheimer's disease pa patients has been observed, um, or in patients with Parkinson's, you might, re uh, you might observe a reduction in ATP in certain regions of the brain, like the putamen and the midbrain. Um, so it, I guess in summary, the mitochondrial damages between Alzheimer's and Parkinson's are indeed similar, but the pathways that lead to those damages are what differ. Um, there's actually a number of great review articles that discuss this, so I can, I can follow up with the listener after the webinar with links to some more information. Oh, okay. Well, thanks again, Tracy, for the great presentation. That's about all we have time for, for today. If we weren't able to get to your question or your question required a more in-depth technical response, we'll follow up with you personally after the webinar. And like Tracy said, she has a review article, so we'll take a look at that. Um, we'll be posting a video recording of the webinar in the next day or so, so watch out for an email from us with a link to the recording as well as this discount code 
For our products, remember you can get up to 20% off the kits. ICT will ha be having several more webinars in 2018, and once we have them scheduled, we'll send you an email and you'll be able to register for them on our web webinars page, like you did for this one. And if you think of any other questions after the webinar or have ideas for future webinar topics, please feel free to reach out to us. Like Tracy says, we'd love to hear from you and learn what you're doing with our products and if you have any questions. If you, you can email us at help at immunochemistry.com or fill out the contact form in our website. And of course, you can always connect to us through social media on Facebook, LinkedIn, or Twitter. We would love to hear from you. And thanks again, Tracy, for the great presentation. And thanks to all of you for joining us today. Have a great day.